for my mystery, I've decided to take on this question of how will we feed 9 billion people on this planet by the year 2050. And spoiler alert, it's actually not a mystery. It's an entirely solvable problem. So I want to set a little bit of context for why. First, let me step back and have you imagine, have you imagine that every day you wake up, <laughs> sorry, that every day you wake up and your PowerPoint slides don't work. <laughs> it's not going back. If you can take me back to the wallet, that would be great. So imagine that every day you wake up and you open up your wallet and there's one third less money in there. Now, also imagine you're a corporation, and that a third of everything you're manufacturing is actually a defective product. What if you had a moving company, and you lost a third of the possessions of every client you had? You'd be out of business really, really quickly. Or if a corporation was leaking 33% of its revenues, the CEO would be fired immediately. But when we look at our global food system, this exact level of loss is something we tolerate and just accept as part of the system. Our global food system is in crisis. One third of all food produced globally is never consumed. And there are 1.2 billion food insecure people on the planet. These are people that truly do not know where their next meal is coming from. They may be hungry or they may be undernourished, but they don't know where that next meal is coming from. And there's actually enough food being wasted and lost to fill that gap. So why does this happen? This is the true mystery. If so much food is wasted, why are so many people on this planet hungry? I want to break it down into a couple of pieces. One of them, is consumer waste. And consumer waste happens on the front end of the food chain. It's what happens when cucumbers rot in your refrigerator drawer, or that mountain of spaghetti that you leave on your plate at your favorite restaurant, or the tons and tons of untouched expired food that are thrown away by retail establishments every year. That's one third of the problem, and that's consumer waste. But post-harvest loss is a hidden piece of the problem. And it accounts for two-thirds of all food that goes unconsumed on this planet. Post-harvest loss is talking about the tomatoes that rot on the vine before they even ever get harvested, or that rot on the truck that broke down on the way to the market. It's about the mangoes that are grown for the mango juice producer but don't meet the quality standards, and there's no secondary market to pick them up. It's about cassava that ferments in the field or at market gate because the market doesn't have the right technology and techniques to preserve it. This is where such a bulk of the problem is. And we're trying to grow our way out of the hunger problem. 95% of all the money that's gone into addressing global hunger over the last 30 years has gone into increasing yields and productivity helping farmers to grow and harvest more. But this is a problem we can't grow our way out of. We have enough food to feed the world today, and we're not getting it to the people that need it. Break down the problem a little bit further. Across the globe, 50% of all fruits and vegetables are lost in post-harvest loss. 20% of cereals and grains are, and 40% of roots and tubers. Across Sub-Saharan Africa alone, 40% of all staple foods, and some say as much as 60% of all staple foods, are lost before they ever make it to market. So what? Uh, so those are some big numbers. Hopefully they're shocking to you. But why does it matter in a bigger context? Well, every pound of food that goes unconsumed is a missed opportunity to improve the health of people, the environment, and economies. And how can it do that? Well, first of all, where people are concerned, as we already mentioned, there's going to be 9 billion people on this planet in 2050 if current population trends continue. 
if we continue to address our food systems the way that we have been and allow the kind of losses I've already described, it will require a 70% increase in food yields to be able to feed those people on this new planet. 70% increase in yield. Now, is growing more part of the solution? Absolutely, there's no question. But growing 70% more is not only unwise, it's probably impossible. Until we figure out how to stem some of this loss and waste, the math is just never going to add up to feed that planet. Now, where the planet's concerned, the cost of all of that unconsumed food is absolutely staggering. The inputs in terms of land, fertilizers, seeds, labor, water, that's going to food that's never consumed is something that we all need to be concerned about. 25% of fresh water globally goes into producing food that never gets eaten. 25% of fresh water globally goes into food that's never eaten. Where profits are concerned, the picture is no rosier. We lose in the global economy every year enough money through food loss and waste to be equivalent to the 2015 profits of all of the Fortune 500 companies combined. That's a staggering statistic. There are half a billion subsistence farmers around the world that lose at least 15%, at least 15% of their incomes to these kind of market inefficiencies. So that's why my organization, Pixar Global, is partnering with the Rockefeller Foundation and the Dengote Group, which is one of the largest businesses in West Africa, to address post-harvest loss in the tomato value chain in northern Nigeria. We are seeking to find ways to get those tomatoes to market and processed in appropriate ways. And we're seeking to reduce the loss of the tomato harvest chain in northern Nigeria by 50% in three years. It's an extremely bold undertaking, but it's entirely doable. And our goal then is to take this model and to use it to address loss in horticultural value chains across the globe, wherever we have that opportunity to put together these kind of terrific partnerships. Now, post-harvest loss is an all-inclusive problem, so it requires an all-inclusive solution. And certainly, Pixera Global, along with Dan Gote and the Rockefeller Foundation, are not going to solve this globally. Companies like Dango, they like Coca-Cola, are coming on board and starting to pay attention and be accountable for this loss, but we need many more companies making many more investments and many more government agencies and social sector organizations. This is going to require helping farmers to access technology. It's about market linkages. It's about that all accounting, that all important accountability, and it's about financial investment. That's what it's going to take to solve this problem. It's also going to take some pretty incredible partnerships across the public, private, and social sectors. I can't emphasize this partnership piece too much. We keep looking at problems across the world and thinking that individual organizations or entities or types of organizations can solve them, and we're so far beyond that. These kind of partnerships are going to drive real change. So that's about post-harvest laws. But I want to change gears a little bit here and talk about our topic, the mysteries of the world, which I internalize to be grand challenges of the world. And I want to think about what are the challenges you all want to take on. My challenge is hunger and post-harvest loss. And all of you can do something about waste with better planning and behavior change. Not everyone can have a real impact on that complex post-harvest loss chain that I talked about. So what are the problems that you care about? When you think about this post-harvest loss question, does it make you think about other questions, other problems that you think you can answer? What are the things you want to impact with your life and your work? And what I really encourage you all to do is to think about a problem that you care about deeply, a problem that you have some knowledge and resources to impact. 
a problem that you're willing to dedicate some effort toward solving in your life, a solvable problem. Most of you may have one in your mind already, but some of you don't. And so if you're looking for a place for inspiration, where am I gonna, where am I gonna identify that problem that I care about so deeply? One place you might want to start is with the global goals, or the sustainable development goals. These were ratified by the United Nations back in September of last year. 17 goals and 169 targets. It's an extremely ambitious agenda. Some may say an unachievable agenda. But it certainly is a vision of a better world. The Global Goals envision a world in 2030 where there's no poverty, no inequality, where on a sustainably maintained planet, no man, woman, or child goes hungry or is ill or is uneducated or unemployed. It's certainly a fantastic vision, and my inner idealist embraces it fully. But I'm also a really practical person, and I know that to make even incremental progress on any of these goals is going to take a human effort we've never seen before. Now, in trying to think about those 17 goals and 169 indicators, a few of us on my team sat down and literally tore apart the UN's proposal, cutting it into strips and taping and retaping the targets and goals on different whiteboards. And we came up with this model as another way to look at the 17 goals. Two things I want to point out here is that our model, while it has four big buckets, shows an awful lot of overlap between the goals. And if it were a perfect model, it would show even more overlap than it does. And that's important because we, we so often stovepipe problems and solutions in this world today. We think we can take on health without taking on the problems of food security. We think we can talk about increased employment without addressing systemic problems in education. So this encourages you to look with a bit of a more systemic approach. The second thing is that partnerships are at the center of this model. Partnerships are a separate goal, number 17. We have put them in the center of our model as an enabler and as critical to any progress we're going to make. So I'll show you these two uh, different graphics of the global goals just as a starting place, maybe a way to identify your problem. Now once you've identified your problem, I have two pieces of advice for you. The first one is to ensure you have the right mindset. Now what do I mean by mindset? I've worked almost 30 years of my career in this field of enriching lives and livelihoods, which some people would call international development. I actually object to the term development because I think it connotes doing something to someone or something. And that may sound very nuanced, but the reality is that some of the most colossal failures of international development over the last 70 years come from this savior mentality, this dropping in to do someone, to do something to someone or for someone. And that has had some catastrophic results for individuals, communities, and nations. So purposeful global engagement, is it just words? Yes, but nomenclature matters, and nomenclature can drive mindset. Purposeful global engagement is about doing something with someone rather than to or for someone. Purposeful global engagement is about listening, really listening, not coming in with preconceived notions and trying to make the facts meet your, meet your notions. Purposeful global engagement is about leading and about being led. We talk all the time about leadership skills now, but boy, do we need some followership skills. We can, we can work on that, and purposeful and global engagement gives you the skills to know when leadership is appropriate and when followership is appropriate. Purposeful global engagement is a different mindset. It's about not helping, and helping feels so good. Philanthropy is important, and charity is important, don't get me wrong. We need to fill immediate humanitarian needs. But purposeful global engagement is about exchange, and it's about service, and it's about support of success. It is a different mindset. Purposeful global engagement has no, there's not my problem. If the Ebola crisis taught us anything, it's that we ignore the well-being of other people and nations at our own great peril. And with global ice caps melting at an incredible pace now, we are quite literally in the same boat now. Purposeful global engagement has no place for third world. 
there's one world. And if we're talking about global hunger, it doesn't matter whether it's in San Francisco or Sao Paulo or Delhi or Detroit. If we're talking about ending extreme poverty, it's for people in Berlin and Bogota, as well as London and Luanda. If we're talking about equal access, it's to education, to deaths for girls in Asia, but it's also to deaths in legislatures in Africa and deaths in boardrooms in North America. It's a different mindset. And finally, uh, now that you've got your part, now you've got your problem, now you've got your, your mindset right, this is about partnership. If we're going to solve these huge global problems or the discrete problems you've identified, we have to have more partnerships across the public, private, and social sector. The most impact I've seen in my career is .com, .gov, .org partnerships. These are not easy. It takes courage to go the partnership route. It's a lot harder. It takes more time. It takes respect for other people's ideas. It takes respect for values that may be very different from your own. It takes courage to think about what's needed and to truly understand that versus what we want to give. And that's what true partnership is about. So in closing, I just want to recommend that Again, you identify a problem, something you care deeply about it, that you go about solving that problem in a purposeful way, that you're working with, not doing to, and that you go out and you find the partners with the right mindset and resources to help you achieve that. If we all get there, if we all do our part, then those egregious challenges that I call mysteries will disappear, and the mysteries that will be left are only the wondrous ones. Thank you.